what I'll um, what I'll do uh, in the couple in the following uh, 20 to 25 minutes or so is uh, talk to you about some work that's been ongoing over the last few years, and then I'll also show you some uh, some newer stuff that we've been doing more recently, which is really uh, related to this question of what controls the uh, the sort of lateral segmentation that we seem to see in the in the Himalaya. And so what I, what I want to do is first walk you through some of the evidence for structural, topographic, and exhumational segmentation of the Himalaya. Um, I'll show you how we've been using thermochronology to say something about the kinematics in, in a cross-section and using the central, the central Nepal Himalaya as an, uh, as an example. Um, and then also how we've used that approach to sort of make a prediction of what lateral variations in topography and exhumation should look like. And I'll try to test that model using some new data we've been collected o collecting over the last few years uh, from the uh, Karnali catchment in, in westernmost Nepal and comparing those with what we see in central Nepal. Okay. So the Himalaya is generally described as this 2,500 kilometer long, basically cylindrical origin. Uh, but if we, if we have, just have a bit of a closer look, like a first order instead of a zero order look at uh, the origin, um, it turns out that it's really not quite as simple as that. And this is just showing, first of this is just a simple geological map, very simplified geological map of, uh, of most of the Himalaya. And so we can see from north to south, so in green here we have Tethian sedimentary series, Tibetan uh, sediments basically. Uh, then we have what is known as the High Himalayan Crystalline or the Greater Himalayan Series in these pinkish colors here, which are high-grade uh, metamorphic rocks, gneisses, uh, which are bounded from, by, uh, from the Lesser Himalaya by the main central thrust here. Uh, uh, the main boundary thrust bounds the Lesser Himalaya from the Siwalik Series, which are Miocene, Myopliocene, uh, foreland basin sediments. And if we just look at the variations in width of these units, we see that they are really quite uh, significant, and this is just plotting, plotting that up very simply. And so we can see that this, if we go from just from west to east along the Himalayan arc here, we can see just looking at the geology that there are some quite significant variations with uh, clippy of uh, uh, higher Himalayan material here, greater Himalayan material, uh, windows of lesser Himalayan material within the, the higher Himalaya, etc. And so one question that we can ask is what controls these types of structures. Uh, I'll be really concentrating on three cross sections here, one through western Nepal, we'll be talking about one through central Nepal here, and I'll show you also, uh, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about a cross section here in, in Bhutan. So if we just look at this central versus western Nepal uh, uh, structure or topography, and if we, if we just look really a first order look at the topography, and this is just a, a really nice image, I, I think it's a satellite image that I got off of this website here, and actually if you fly from Kathmandu to New Delhi, you sit on the right side of the plane, you get a, a really pretty good view of this from a bit of a different angle, but you see the same thing. So what we're seeing here, this is the Annapurna Massif, this is the Daulagiri Massif, both well over 8,000 meters high, they're separated from each other here by the Kaligandaki uh, valley, which is one of the deepest gorges on earth. And then if we go west from there, we can see that basically this high, very high ridge line of very high peaks disappears. The ridge line seems to be jumping north for about nearly 100 kilometers here. Peaks are not as high as they are here. Here we have these 8,000ers. Uh, in this western Nepal region, peaks rarely reach much more than 6,500 meters. Um, and so we see that we really have quite a, a dramatic lateral change in, in the topography here. Now, this is also reflected when we look at climate or precipitation patterns in uh, the Himalaya. And this, so this is a pretty well-known work, I guess, by Bodo Boghagen. This is the, the last version of that where he shows uh, uh, compilations of uh, precipitation from uh, satellite data. And so what this shows, of course, the first order control, obviously, is first order pattern is this very strong orographic precipitation gradient with, uh, of course, very high precipitation on the south flank of, um, 
the, uh, uh, of the origin, very dry on the distant side. If we look in a bit more detail, what we can see is actually that sometimes this high precipitation band, there's a single band of high precipitation like in, the, in Bhutan here, and then if we move over to Nepal, we see that we have a double band of precipitation. We move further west, that seems to be, to, the, the double band is less clearly expressed. It comes back and then we go into a single band as well, uh, again here. So we see that even in the precipitation patterns, again, we clearly have um, lateral uh, variations as well. And I'm going to just show you two cross sections here, again, co contrasting Western and Central Nepal. And <coughs> So this is just looking in gray, this is the topography here. In red, this is the, the relief, so the, the variation of topography. And then in blue, you have the precipitation. And what we can see here, there's really two, two types of uh, topographic uh, transits. And this was, this was actually discussed in quite some detail by, uh, by Bokhagen and Burg Burbank in both their papers. And so if we look at central Nepal, what we can see, so here we have this double precipitation peak quite clearly, quite, quite well developed. And this second peak of precipitation here is uh, associated with a significant topographic uh, increase in, in topography and relief here, which is known as the topographic transition zone. Um, and, uh, and so this, this, the three of these seem to be correlated. Whereas if we go into Western Nepal, we can see that the, the, the topography seems to rise much more uh, linearly, we don't have this clear double peaked uh, precipitation pattern, and the relief here, while high, is not nearly as high as what we see in central Nepal. If we look at exhumation rates, and this is a compilation, a recent compilation of um, uh, thermal chronology data, appetite and zergon fishing track and argon argon on white mica. So there's, there's quite a bit of data available now. And if we just look at this, it's, it's quite busy, so it's quite hard to really see some of the patterns here. But if we focus on one of the systems and we just look at, uh, at how that varies, we can see there's significant variation, obviously, across the origin, but also in the same unit as we go along the origin, ages uh, vary uh, quite significantly. The other thing I just want to point out here is this big data gap in, in Western Nepal here. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One is logistics. Uh, the area is, is pretty difficult to access. Basically, there's no roads. And secondly, this was, until recently, quite a dangerous place to go because of the uh, Maoist uprising in Nepal. Um, so if we, look, if we have a bit of a closer look again at how these ages vary, and then uh, comparing now central Nepal here and, uh, and Bhutan, uh, <clears throat> so again, here are topo our profiles of topography, precipitation, relief, and we can see that Bhutan is an, actually an even better example of this linear increase in uh, topography, single peak precipitation, uh, and basically relatively subdued relief compared to what we see in central Nepal. If we look at the thermochronological ages, so the exhumation patterns, what we see is in uh, central Nepal, so these are appetite fishing track ages in both cases. Uh, if we go across the origin here, so from the main boundary thrust, the uh, south, uh, southern side of the lesser Himalaya into the main central thrust and the, and the higher Himalaya here, we can see that in general, ages decrease as we go northward towards the topographic transition and the main central thrust. Whereas if we look at the Bhutan case, uh, this is actually not a real transect. This is basically the data from Bhutan all plotted together, so it's not as, as clean as this one, which is a transect. Um, but we, d we don't seem to see that pattern. If anything, these ages appear to increase as we go north from uh, the main boundary thrust into the main central thrust in the higher Himalaya. So the, these patterns of, um, of exhumation also clearly seem to be uh, varying laterally. And, and interestingly, so this basically is a zoom of, of this central part of the profile here. And what we clearly see is this relationship, this, this strong spatial correlation between high topography and relief, high precipitation here on uh, the uh, topographic transition zone, and very rapid exhumation, as indicated by very young thermochronological ages of typically uh, a million years or less for appetite fishing track. So, Correlation, of course, seeing a correlation then asks the question of the cause and effect relationships. And, and this has been quite strongly discussed uh, over the last 10 years or so, this question of 
what controls the link between uh, the steep topography, high precipitation, and rapid exhumation. There's been really two, um, two propositions. One suggested uh, a climatic control through uh, out-of-sequence thrusting that would be reactivated through climatically driven uh, focused erosion on that area. Uh, and another class of models suggested more of a tectonic control by arguing that what we were actually seeing was focused uplift and erosion uh, over a, a crystal ramp. And so to answer that question, really the, the thermal chronology data is, is quite useful because we should see quite different patterns in uh, thermal chronological ages as we go across this, um, in the transect, across the Himalaya for, for both cases. So in the uh, overthrusting scenario, what we would expect to see, so basically this is a very simplified cross-section here across uh, the central Himalaya, so we have these thrusts here which are all branching on this main Himalayan thrust, which is basically the plate interface between the Indian plate here and the Himalaya. So if, if we have a big ramp in uh, that uh, main Himalayan thrust, and there's actually quite a bit of geophysical evidence for that now, what we would expect to see for both high and low temperature thermal chronometers is this sort of uh, uh, continuous decrease in ages towards uh, the, uh, the topographic transition zone here. Whereas in the case where we would have significant out-of-sequence thrusting, what we would be expecting are jumps in ages over uh, these thrusts. So again, looking at these, uh, topograph or these thermal chronological age profiles, so this is the same appetite fission track data I've shown you just a couple of slides before, collected here in this transect across uh, central Nepal, just west into the Trisuli River here. Um, what we seem to see is this sort of continuous decrease in ages uh, as we go towards the north, both in the low temperature system here in Appetite Fission Track and in a higher temperature uh, mica argon argon ages. And so to, to go a little bit beyond that, uh, we've developed a, a thermokinematic model in which uh, basically what we're, we're doing, we're driving exhumation here by overthrusting uh, above this large uh, detachment zone here, this main model, main Himalayan thrust. Um, we can include an out of sequence thrust in, uh, in the model here, and so basically split our overthrusting velocity here into an out of sequence velocity and a velocity on the frontal, uh, on the frontal part of that system here. Uh, and then we can play around with the geometry of uh, this detachment system here. And so if we do that, just showing some forward models here of um, what this would look like. So in case of just a single uh, detachment here, a single flat detachment here, and in case of a system where we, where we do have this out of sequence thrust that is reactivated, and if we look at what we would predict here as the pattern of ages as a function of the velocity on this out of sequence thrust here, uh, we can see that, that we predict differences in these patterns, but comparing them to the actual data, which is shown in yellow here, is, is maybe not that simple because there's quite a bit of noise in the data itself and the, the patterns are uh, slightly complex. So to do that in a statistically more rigorous way, uh, basically what we do is combine this model with an inversion algorithm where we are going to look for best fitting parameters and basically we're inverting them for this overthrusting velocities out of sequence velocity here and the geometry of, uh, of this detachment. And so basically what that tells us, uh, what we can do with that type of inversion is basically search a parameter space for optimally fitting uh, model parameter values here, but then we can also uh, sort of, uh, we can also have an idea of the resolution uh, on our parameter values by looking at probability density functions of those. So in this example here, we can see that our parameter one here is fairly well, well resolved, which is uh, indicated by this fairly narrow, nicely peaked uh, PDF for parameter values here, whereas our second parameter value is less well resolved and has this sort of broader, uh, less speed PDF. So if we do that for central Nepal, what we're basically seeing here, so this is showing overthrusting velocity or out of sequence velocity here as a function of 
of the geometry, the location of the, the top and the bottom of uh, the crustal ramp in the detachment. And what we're seeing is we actually don't resolve the geometry of the detachment that well, but we do get so, uh, quite a, a good uh, resolution for the out-of-sequence velocity, and it tends to zero. So basically suggesting that uh, we can explain these data by overthrusting over a ramp, the geometry of which would look something like that, but you can see the error bars on that, which are, are quite significant, and the predicted data uh, here in red for the best misfit model. Okay, so what we concluded from that is basically we can explain this rapid exhumation in the topographic transition zone by focused uplift and erosion over a crustal ramp. And so the next question then is, if that's the case, what would be the significance of lateral variations in topography, uh, precipitation, and exhumation. So to do that, we use the same methodology basically to invert several data sets. So here's our central Nepal data set uh, and model. Um, there was one just to the west of that in the Annapurnas and Kaligandaki region, and uh, a data, the data set from Bhutan here. And what we came up with was uh, geometries of what this detachment should look like and where uh, the, the ramp should be, which uh, look like this. So th uh, this is so for central Nepal, so quite well-expressed crustal ramp here, uh, an even stronger, even better expressed crustal ramp in this uh, area here, where we have actually the youngest ages recorded uh, in the central Himalaya. And in contrast to that, lack of a crustal ramp in the, in the Bhutan cross-section here. Now, this is actually quite comparable to a, a completely independent uh, uh, estimate or suggestion of what this crustal detachment should look like from geodesy data, um, which was uh, done some 10 years ago, uh, where basically they inverted GPS data to have uh, some idea of the, uh, of the geometry of, the, of this ramp. And basically what that predicted is that in Western Nepal here, the ramp should be much more subdued. And so we can actually test this model now uh, by going to look at, at what's happening in Western Nepal. So again, uh, we would suggest then that this, the significance, that these lateral variations are controlled tectonically by lateral variations in the detachment geometry. So to test the model, um, what we can do is then go to Western uh, Nepal and compare topography and exhumation rates there with the pattern in central Nepal because a lateral change in ramp geometry is predicted, so we should see that in uh, the ages. And then the second question I'll come to at the end is, can we say anything about the origins of uh, lateral variations in this detachment geometry? Okay, so this is then some new data that we've been collected, uh, collecting in uh, the Karnali catchment here in Western Nepal. So um, there's not a whole lot of data here. There's, there's, there's about 10 new data points. There's two reasons for that. One, as I said, uh, basically, to go here, you can fly into a small airport that's about here, and then from then on, it's walking only, so you carry out your samples by mules. And second, most of this is in uh, lesser Himalayan rocks, and uh, many of you, well, those of you who've worked uh, there know that they're not the most ideal to do thermochronology. But anyway, these are the ages here, and so they're typically in the like, six, seven, eight million year range here in, in this area of, uh, of the lesser Himalaya here, and they're slightly younger um, in, the, in the MCT zone here. If we compare that to what we've seen in central Nepal, and basically, well, I'm, I'm not plotting up the ages here, but just a sort of a first order guess at exhumation rates using a, a, a 1D thermal model, uh, basically what we're seeing here is uh, exhumation rates of maybe 0.5-ish here in, in this area, a bit higher than that. And already, if we look at, th there's quite a contrast here because on average, exhumation rates seem to be significantly higher in, in central Nepal. And in particular, the, the region where we get these high exhumation rates seems to be much wider here than, than what we see in, the, in western Nepal. Secondly, what we did is we looked at river incision using unit stream power. So basically, what we're plotting up here uh, unit stream power is uh, basically the density of water, the acceleration of gravity times the, the discharge, and we got the discharge by integrating the precipitation from uh, the Boghagen map uh, over, the, uh, over the catchment. Uh, 
the local slope here, which you can get just of uh, DEMs, and then the width of the river, uh, which we uh, got off satellite imagery, and there's quite detailed topographic maps of it. Um, basically, we put that in. This is what we come up with, and this, so this is for the Karnali River. Basically, what we're seeing here is sort of a fairly wide area of sort of elevated uh, unit stream power, uh, maximum here, this becomes important, is about 1,000 watts per square meter. Uh, there, se there seem to be some peaks here, one on uh, the main central thrust, and then one here at the south of the Dadeldura clip and, and uh, another area here. Um, so this is the pattern we see in the, in the Karnali River. If we compare that to central Nepal, we'll be looking at the Trizuli River here, where uh, most of our, our thermochrom data came from. What we can see is we have a much more, seem to have a much more peak distribution in street unit stream power here, but especially the maximum here is 4,000 watts per square meter. So it's four times as high as what we're seeing in the Karnali. And we're seeing this, this major peak here, which is exactly associated with this topographic transition zone here. There's a smaller peak here, uh, which from the satellite imagery seems to be associated with a, a recent uh, very large landslide. If we just compare our exhumation rates from the thermocron data with the unit stream power, we see there's, there's, there's quite a reasonable correlation if we plot up both rivers. We can also see that how the Karnali River data here plots or seem to plot in the lower left of this, uh, of this plot as compared to the Trizuli. And this is this, this outlier here is this uh, peak in stream power where we, uh, which we suggest is controlled by recent landsliding. Right. Okay, so, so overall there seems to be quite a decent correlation so that this unit stream power is actually telling us something about present day incision rate. So again, if we compare both cross sections here, so this is just showing two geological cross sections, uh, the topography, the uh, uh, appetite fishing track ages here in both cases, and then the unit stream power. I'm sorry, the points have come out pretty small here. Um, so <coughs> again, we see this very strong peak in, uh, in unit stream power here in the Trizuli associated with these very uh, young uh, uh, fishing track ages suggesting high exhumation rates exactly at the topographic transition zone. And we seem to be seeing this sort of much wider um, uh, distribution of, of stream power in this case with the ages that are generally quite a bit older except right at the main central thrust uh, in the main central thrust region here. So at first, again, at first order, this, this seems to be going in the direction or sort of confirming the, the hypothesis that we put out uh, that uh, these lateral variations do seem to be controlled by crystal scale detachment geometry. So just last question then is the origin of these lateral variations. And again, two suggestions have been made. They could be related to inherited structures in the under-thrusting Indian plate. Um, but actually another suggestion that was made already some time ago and, and, and quite largely ignored uh, is that what we, could be, what we could be looking at is actually some sort of change in the accretion cycle associated with growth of the Himalayan fold and thrust belt in the Himalayan duplex. And, um, Jonathan Mercier, during his PhD work, has been doing some modeling work to show basically how that could work. And basically, so what we're seeing here is basically how we could build sort of something that looks like a lesser Himalayan duplex and isolate here a clipper of higher Himalayan material. Um, but what is really interesting is if you look at how these thrust sheets here uh, accrete to uh, this, this duplex structure, you can see actually what's happening is that there's this ramp which is uh, transiently uh, coming through the system. I'll just, this is another model, but I'll run it just, and just look at the, uh, at the deformation here. Is this running? No. Okay. If you look at the strain here, you can really see this, this ramp basically moving northward through the system. And so basically what we could be looking at in the Himalaya is sort of this sort of transient accretion cycle with areas that have a ramp and laterally areas that, that don't. Okay, and Carolina has stood up, so I'll just leave my conclusions here uh, and open for questions and discussion. Thank you. Questions? Junior, please. <laughs> 
Must be. okay, non junior then. <laughs> Peter, you showed that in some cases there is quite strong and local expression of the of the, the ramps. Um, inherent in your model is the presence of lateral ramps. Yes. Do they have a, an equally strong expression in seismicity, in topography, in erosion? Um, some do. In particular, if you between. Eastern Nepal, Sikkim, and the Bhutan segment, there's something called the Yadong structure, which has been recognized for a long time, uh, and so which is clearly recognized as a significant lateral structure, which could be associated with one of these lateral ramps. Again, it, between Central and Western Nepal, there are, there are structures, there are actually active, there's an active strike slip fault, which could be accommodating this, uh, um, this change in detachment geometry. So in some cases, yes, I do think we see these lateral structures. In other cases, they're, they're more subdued, but we haven't really been looking for them either. So. Um, you, s you seem to accept the notion that, that climate could be driving the added sequence thrusting of the way Hodges and others were suggesting. but. But once you get to a mid-crustal ramp, you say that must be tectonics. I mean, how can we actually ever, ever unravel that, that control? Could, why couldn't climate do exactly the same as generating out of sequence thrust? It just drops a detachment and gives us some underplating as an easy, as a least work uh, approach to deforming the system. Uh, well, that really goes back to the, the chicken and egg question, right? Which, and, so, which is now 25 years old, and I then think why, we, why we always really go back to saying something's tectonically or climatically controlled? Well, because if the question is what what is really the driver in the system, and what appears to be the, the driver in the system here is the geometry of the the main crustal detachment, and so unless. You, you could argue that that geometry is actually climatically controlled by, you know, top-down driven erosion from the surface. Um, but you seem, I mean, these, these ramps in the detachment seem to be sort of quite common in uh, models of evolution of, of foreland, foreland thrust belts and, and duplex structures. So, uh, I don't think you really need the climatic variability to, to explain the presence or the absence of, of these ramps. And so in that case, basically the precipitation pattern is, is responding to the topography that's being built, but it's not really feeding back into what is actually building that topography. Um, I have a question about, the, um, let's say, the difference between the present day situation when we are, let's say, in the interglacial time what do you think would be the uh, control on the climate precipitation and so on in the interglacial times? When, uh, sorry, in the glacial times when you have the buildup of much more uh, glacial whatever load on the mountains and so on? Well, in the central Himalaya, actually, I think that the, the glacial interglacial variation is probably smaller than what we see in other mountain belts. And there's there's one main reason for that, is that the main precipitation in the Himalayan is during the monsoon, which is in summer. And so if you look at actually the, the glacial extents during, uh, during glacial times, okay, it's larger than today, but it's not any, the difference is not anywhere as large as what you can see in the Alps, for instance, right? So I, would actually, I think I would argue that, that at least in the central Himalaya, the glacial interglacial control on erosion rates is probably smaller than what you can see in other mountain belts. And that, but that's just because of the, of the particular configuration and because of the distribution of precipitation through the, through the year. Yeah, but of course, the climate zones are also shifting to the, yeah. the Yeah, that's true. But the, uh, the main argument would be just looking at the, at the maximum glacier extents. And you can see okay, there, there are several kilometers down, but they're not like tens or hundreds of kilometers down, like, like what you can see in, in other mountain belts. Um, do, you, do you have a sense for the time scale of the formation of these new ramp structures versus the time scale of your thermochronology data? Okay, so 
the, uh, the, the, the forward models I showed there are running for about 20 to 25 million years. You build about five thrust sheets during that time. So typically the cycle would take maybe about five million years or so, something in that, that order of magnitude. So you could be integrated. So you could be actually, um, I mean, the, the appetite fission track should be able to see that because you're, I mean, the, the youngest ages are well below that. But the higher systems should not be able to see that because you would be integrating over the, over the cycles. Yeah. One last question. Yeah. How good are the uh, deep crystal uh, constraints in terms of geophysical data on this lateral variations and uh, possible lateral variations in deeper structure? Um, in central Nepal, the data are very good. There's been several uh, large geophysical experiments run, and so we have a, a good constraint on the geometry, in particular the geometry of the main Himalayan detachment. Laterally, there's really not much data at all. So the geophysical data is, is not very good. There's, we can have a look at the micro seismicity, uh, which seems to show these variations. And then there's the, the GPS, data, the geodetic data that we can invert to get a model of the, of, the, uh, of the detachment, but it's not anywhere as good as what we see in central Nepal. So. All right, thank you, Peter. Thank you. And uh, we're going to move on to the next, uh, the next talk. As soon as I can get the microphone. Yeah. Lancaster University, um, investigating tectonic erosion interactions, a Himalayan case study.